Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'll call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, scheduling updates. I wanted to let folks know that we took off uh, the primary care advisory group meeting that was scheduled for the 20th this evening, um, and we put that to next month. Um, we also added a morning meeting for next week's um, schedule. So that meeting starts at 9 a.m. And that is Blue Cross and Blue Shield and MVP will be coming before the board to share their updates on healthcare reform and other activities. And then we'll come back in the afternoon and we'll hear from the University of Vermont uh, Medical Health, University of Vermont Health Network and um, on an update on the inpatient psych unit. And then we also have after them um, our colleagues from the Department of Mental Health who will be um, giving us an update on their work. So I just wanted to make sure folks knew about those scheduling updates. And then two, on, two public comments. Um, we have the ongoing public comment um, period for any comments folks have regarding the potential next agreement with uh, all payer model agreement with CMMI. Um, we'd ask for you to share those comments with us. We share all of those comments, sorry, with the um, our partners at AHS as well as the governor's office. Um, and then uh, the other public comment is the Department of Financial Regulation and the Department of Vermont Health Access um, came before us uh, earlier uh, last month and um, talked to us and presented information on the new EHB benchmark plan. That is open for public comment. And um, if you go on our public comment uh, portal on our website, we have a link to the Department of Financial Regulation website, and you can public comment there. I want to alert folks that that uh, public comment period ends 5 p.m. Eastern on Monday, May 2nd. So please get those comments in if you have them. And I have nothing else to report. I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for the howling dog in the background. He likes to howl at the answering machine, so. <laughs> okay. Next on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, April 13th. Is there a motion? I moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, April 13th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes were approved unanimously. So next, I'm gonna turn it back to Susan Barrett to introduce the, the uh, Leadership and Preventive Medicine Residency um, doctors. So, Susan. Yeah, it's actually a really hard concept. They're residents, but they're also doctors. So I, they'll explain their program um, when they introduce themselves. But thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, today, we're welcoming um, doctors from Dartmouth's Leadership in Preventive Medi Medicine Residency Program. Um, they are currently performing their government rotation uh, with us uh, at the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, this is, I think, the fourth year we've hosted um, residents from this program, and it's been a really valuable experience for us at the Green Mountain Care Board, and I hope for the residents as well. Um, I, again, I, I know they'll get into a little more details about their program, but just as a summary, uh, these physicians are they're currently in medical training in various fields at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And they've also uh, been in, accepted into this LPMR program for additional training, uh, which at the end of that training culminates in um, the, the, the fact that they have a master's in public health on top of their um, specialty that they are, uh, they are doctors in. Um, I, just a little background on the work they've done with us this year. 
Um, they've worked with our staff on Act 159 Hospital Sustainability Planning Report. And then they've also worked with our data team to look at ways to improve race and ethnicity data and collection and claims so that we can help inform um, health equity programs in the state. They're both uh, still working with us, but I know they're going to they're going to be wrapping up soon, and they're going to be moving on uh, both of them to uh, exciting new programs, which I know they'll share with us in their presentation. So I want to um, turn it over to Drs. Avail and Dr. Fang, and they're going to share their perspective on hospital sustainability and value-based care from a clinical perspective, and then also offer a high-level overview of health equity and how we may measure that in regulatory processes. So I will turn it over to the doctors. Thanks, Susan. Um, this is uh, gonna be pretty interesting. Thank you, Anis. <laughs> um, so we are, uh, as Susan said, clinicians from various backgrounds. Uh, I myself, uh, I am uh, internal medicine trained, board certified, um, and uh, Ani Zovaye, uh, she will introduce herself, but she is also internal medicine trained and also uh, infectious disease trained as well. Um, and we're very happy to uh, be here. We're very thankful to be given the platform to speak with you guys and to work with the Green Mountain Care Board uh, on multiple issues, um, as Susan had mentioned, and um, you know, uh, having the opportunity to share this public comment, uh, which uh, was submitted to you guys um, and uh, for you guys to read over has been uh, quite rewarding. Uh, it really gave us um, sort of new perspectives and sort of the approach to uh, healthcare policy uh, and certainly something experiential for us to, uh, to reflect on. Um, but uh, anyways, this is going to be sort of a focused uh, public, I guess you can call it public opinion or testimony on uh, reflecting on the public opinion piece that we submitted. Um, and furthermore, we have uh, no disclosures of any kind. Um, my next slide. So as uh, I was saying, our expertise is in uh, biomedicine and clinical care. Uh, what, what that means is fairly concrete, despite what others may think. We went to medical school to study the human body, its biology, physiology, and its disease states. Um, in other words, you know, you ask us about heart disease, and we can probably talk for hours of reciting causes, pathophysiology, medications, therapies, uh, et cetera, um, and how to treat and manage uh, such disease processes. Uh, however, if you ask us uh, about how to get medications and therapies in the most efficient and best way possible to the patient or to the community, uh, we can have a discussion, but ultimately uh, I myself would probably say, oh, I would probably ask my case manager or nurse uh, care coordinators in, in the office because we're not experts in that field. For us, uh, our uh, further training has led us towards um, a new perspective in medicine uh, in the LPM program, uh, beyond the concrete science and rather into healthcare delivery uh, and implementation of efficient uh, methods on uh, promoting that type of delivery. And we're here today with you uh, because we believe there ought to be a voice uh, heard from healthcare workers. Obviously, you know, we're merely providing a facet uh, of the many other individuals involved in direct patient care, but we hope that uh, what we say may uh, cling on and um, uh, have some influence uh, for the board today. Um, next slide. And so, you know, I, I'm terrible at giving uh, or making PowerPoints, but um, a lot of people have said that I can, you know, talk to a brick wall and I'll talk back. So I just put one <laughs> name on here, and this is an example of a patient. His name is Fred. Uh, Fred is known to, um, Obviously, it's a pseudonym, uh, but uh, this is a clinical case that I, myself, and uh, Anis have come across a few times. Um, you know, those who read our public opinion piece uh, that was submitted to the committee already know who Fred is, but for those who did not, uh, he was a patient that inter intersected with um, uh, our uh, healthcare uh, clinics. 
You know, despite having excellent subspecialist care, he ultimately was admitted to the hospital due to an infection that was not well controlled in the community, uh, as an outpatient, rather. Uh, unfortunately, the reason for Fred's admission was his hesitation to follow up due to the care, uh, cost of care and a reluctance to spend his hard-earned money out of pocket to ensure that his illness uh, was taken care of. Fred's story is unfortunately not that uncommon. Uh, and certainly during the pandemic, we've seen um, uh, uh, slightly more cases of it. Uh, we all have seen patients who could not afford uh, even an annual visit due to the lack of coverage by insurance, uh, lack of qualifying factors so that uh, they can have Medicare or Medicaid or simply didn't feel the need to see a physician uh, until uh, whatever chronic disease state or illness uh, was too late to, to reverse. You know, in our minds, uh, Fred is a persona that motivates us to do better. Next slide. And so I, I don't think many uh, individuals understand what physicians do on a daily basis, which is fine because uh, it's <laughs> mostly sort of details anyway. But more and more, we are hearing physicians leaving the workforce, retiring early or uh, sort of burning out, right? The, the uh, phrase burnout. Uh, is often heard. What you typically see uh, if you uh, at every visit with the provider is uh, you see us running back and forth uh, in the clinical space. Uh, we see about 10 to 20 patients on average a day spending about 20 to 40 minutes with each patient on a good day and having a wide range of discussions with our patients, whether it's about their illness or simply sharing uh, life events. Some days the conversations can be very simple, like you know, take a vitamin every day or no, you really should continue this medication to very difficult conversations about end of life care and uh, hospice. Ultimately, uh, what is not seen is what drains us most because a discussion about medicine and therapies or treatment is what we are trained to do. But behind the scenes, we enter billing and coding parameters for our patient encounters making sure that we charge as high as possible for the patient visit we just completed. We learn about new updates in the electronic medical record and click around sometimes aimlessly to try and figure it out. We coordinate our workflows with our colleagues and medical assistants, uh, secretaries, nurses, uh, whom without them, we would be lost. We spend time on the phone with patients and other providers to share information, give instructions, something that cannot be billed we send faxes, emails, advocate for our patients in public or government settings like we are now. And most of these tasks are completed outside of the face-to-face -face hours with our patient, usually between eight and five every day. And usually in the primary care setting, such conversations and work may be unequally compensated. So let's take a look at an example uh, of a specific encounter from um, a clinic day for me. So knee osteoarthritis uh, or, you know, uh, arthritis for short. Um, so usually it involves a yearly checkup for lifestyle review, uh, weight loss and exercise measures to strengthen the knee joint, screening and uh, screening for other diseases that potentially can be contributing to uh, osteoarthritis, physical therapy, medications, and uh, time. So time is very important. And usually these visits to prevent further damage from arthritis, uh, it takes multiple encounters over months or years. Now let's consider, you know, the alternative. Let's say, uh, you know, the knee osteoarthritis had gotten so bad because of improper follow-up or what have you, that a knee replacement was needed. Well, this is a surgical intervention, so it needs a surgical evaluation. You need a surgical team, you need medical equipment, you need rehab after the surgery. The time required is certainly shorter. It's hours to days to weeks for rehab. Uh, but, you know, the cost is going to be several tens of thousands of dollars just in a conservative estimate. Next slide. So another example, uh, if that didn't sort of drive home the point, let's take a look at coronary disease, coronary heart disease. Usually in the primary setting, uh, it involves, again, uh, yearly checkup, cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure checks on a yearly basis, the correct medications, lifestyle modifications, follow-ups in the office, evaluation of cardiac risk. Usually it takes one outpatient care team, usually the primary care team, and perhaps a cardiologist. And the time required, again, is time. Uh, multiple encounters over 
uh, months to years. But once there is an acute coronary event or a heart attack, uh, more colloquially, the immediate interventions kick in to save the heart and the patient's life. And so the cost of an acute, to treat an acute heart attack is, again, several tens of thousands and upwards to estimates of hundreds of thousands by some estimates across the country. Next slide. So, you know, this brings up some, some questions, and I'll, I'll present some of the rhetorical questions here, uh, which uh, we ought to think about, um, which you may or may not already have an answer in your mind. Um, you know, which is better for the patient? Which is better for the bottom line for a healthcare system? And which one prevents a uh, worsening of the disease process, right? Is it, is it um, the preventive measures and the yearly follow-up and making sure that uh, the risk is lowest, or is it actually going forward with the high-risk uh, surgical interventions or procedural interventions that are certainly able to um, prevent uh, further damage, but does it prevent future issues down the road? And after all this, the question is how to balance this out, right? Uh, I'm an advocate for the need of any sort of medical intervention or um, acute intervention uh, in medicine. Preventive me medicine only does so much, and we're aware of that. And without the capacity to do procedures uh, as listed above, uh, that would be a serious flaw in our healthcare system. Rather, what uh, me and my colleagues are advocating for is changing the incentive and perspective that permeates the healthcare system today. That increased spending and billing for encounters and procedures is good because it earns us more money. Uh, we're advocating for a system or rather, rather at least the change in culture where it is good to have that conversation about weight loss or to have that conversation about lifestyle changes and other preventive measures to stave off the need for a costly, risky, and sometimes uh, very, very acute and immediate procedure. All right. Uh, so this approach should be data-driven. Uh, evidence-based, uh, and certainly in the primary care setting. All this uh, can and should be executed in a primary care setting. Um, the emphasis on this is data-driven. Uh, there is a wealth of data available publicly and even more troves of data available within each healthcare system uh, that is uh, privately owned. There are methods to put that data to work and not have it just sit in some data warehouse. And all this data, both clinical and administrative, can be used to target populations and deliver the care uh, that is needed in a more precise and uh, efficient manner. All the while anticipating gaps in care to an extent in the future. In addition, there needs to be a strategy to address health equity, which we believe can be solved uh, with appropriate utilization of the data you already have. And so how do we address this? Uh, let, let's, let's take a look at the example again uh, with heart disease. Next slide. So here we have a map of uh, northern New Hampshire uh, with the shaded area on the left, uh, so the left panel there. Shaded area being the estimated driving time uh, of one hour around um, uh, a very prominent academic medical center uh, in Burlington. Uh, so that's pinpointed by the uh, car icon. So in essence, the shaded area is the uh, patient catchment area around uh, the academic medical center's uh, cardiology clinics in, in Burlington, Vermont. We see that this catchment area overlaps quite nicely with areas uh, of Vermont with the lowest prevalence of primary cardiovascular issues reported between 2013 and 2015. That's the uh, right-hand side. Uh, some individuals might say, well, telehealth can expand that coverage a bit. Uh, there's data for that as well. Uh, next slide. So here is a survey which uh, shows that uh, the percentage, percentage of individuals per county that have at least 25 megabits per second of internet speed. Some consider this as the minimum uh, you need for a successful telehealth video conference or telehealth video interview. So in the Northeast Kingdom, we see uh, the county of Essex highlighted. Uh, this is highlighted because it has less than 15% of individuals having this specific internets be capable of a video telehealth uh, appointment. In addition to the surrounding counties uh, around Essex County uh, have a range between 40 to 60% of individuals with this minimum uh, required internet speed. Next slide. And so what's really important to us? Um, 
You know, I, I gave the previous two slides and the uh, data representation mainly to make the point that you had this data available to address certain inequities in your state and in the healthcare system. For me, as a, a clinician, we sort of gravitate not only towards our uh, teaching, our education, and our uh, training, but we have certain tools in our toolbox that we can use. And clinicians have uh, risk indices and risk scores. And these, uh, what these risk scores and risk indices are, are uh, peer-reviewed, uh, published, evidence-based scores that help us sort of determine a, a more holistic picture of a patient's illness and prognosis. It's mainly an input-output relationship. We put in what we find in our history and exam into a calculator, and it gives us a score or percentage of uh, likelihood of disease. It is sometimes very useful uh, for definitive decision making, but more often than not, it serves as a guide for us when it comes to thinking about a medical management issue or case and trying to anticipate clinical course or outcomes in the future. In other words, risk scores, uh, when created appropriately, statistically justified and clinically proven, uh, act as guides for our clinical decision making. And one way of thinking about it is it compresses a lot of the individual data points that we see in our patient cases into an overall score that lets us understand a broader picture of the case. Um, so my work um, at, at Dartmouth is risk stratifying individuals in a population level with regards to chance of admission to the hospital. Uh, next slide. Yeah, similar, has been, uh, similar work has been done already, uh, focusing on specific illnesses uh, like community acquired pneumonia. And this is the graphic. Um, a, a results graph uh, that we'll go over in just a second. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not involved in healthcare, community-acquired pneumonia, or we call it as CAP uh, for short, is an infection of the lungs, either by virus or bacteria, that usually requires an admission to the hospital. This diagnosis also pretends to an increased risk of readmission. And so this article by uh, the um, <laughs> this individual who uh, I won't try and butcher uh, their name on uh, the public air, uh, published in a very prominent journal, Chest, uh, in 2009, showing that uh, certain risk factors pretend to a worse survival, or in this case, event-free survival, after uh, discharge from the hospital. So in this article, uh, he and the colleagues uh, looked at the propensity for readmission among patients initially admitted for pneumonia and distinguished certain risk factors such as laboratory tests, vital signs, length of their initial admission, et cetera, and came up with a method of risk stratifying these patients. Now, looking at this, you can see that individuals with three risks or more had a uh, worse survival uh, outcome compared to those individuals with a zero or one risk factor. You know, as a clinician, I can then take these results and conclusion, apply them to the patient in front of me, uh, whom I'm uh, perhaps seeing for community acquired pneumonia, and it helps guide me to understand how to approach their transitions of care back from the hospital to the community and their homes in the most efficient and safe manner possible. For example, I can see that an individual with, uh, with zero risk factors, I can uh, not delegate as much resources and time and uh, nursing care and uh, uh, nursing care visits as much as I would for an individual who I see with three or more risk factors. The principle can be applied to other uh, chronic disease processes such as uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, emphysema. On a pa uh, population level, one can even focus down on the, um, these most highly prevalent, highly costly chronic diseases. All of these in the primary care setting. And we can uh, highlight these individuals uh, to help in, in our communities and be able to delegate the necessary resources in a much more efficient manner. This can also be applied to the general population uh, with regards to morbidity and mortality risk beyond just the single disease process. And I'm certain that with the data that you have, uh, you can do it too. <laughs> this allows um, a healthcare provider to look at the patient, see a risk score, and be guided appropriately through a more holistic medical decision-making process. Um, and like I said, uh, this is a good start for what we're advocating for. Uh, the use of the, the risk adjustments uh, based on clinical conditions is a reasonable approach, and it's much better than trying to figure out 
um, ICD-10 codings, uh, billing codings, and then ultimately trying to figure out uh, the best approach to management and care delivery for our patients. Next slide. Uh, what else needs to be done? Um, well, this is just a start, like I had said, to utilize uh, risk scores and adjustments properly. Uh, you know, for Vermont, Vermont's population um, and also uh, hopefully broadly speaking, uh, but you need to sort of get into the data a little deeper. Uh, it's not just sort of looking at bar charts and uh, line plots on sort of a one-dimensional surface of, of that data representation, right? Uh, this involves talking to your patients, the Vermont citizens, and looking at how they behave in uh, your health healthcare systems uh, through both public and hospital data. I do this type of stuff, this risk stratification uh, at my own institution, and speaking to patients, I see uh, what works and what doesn't. Uh, and I look at our population, uh, patient population data and come up with ways to efficiently target and reach out uh, to those most in need to prevent readmissions and adverse medical events. It isn't straightforward, it doesn't happen overnight, uh, but if I can do it with my team of uh, four, uh, pharmacist, uh, secretary, and two nurses, um, then I'm fairly certain that you, with you, all of your resources and your healthcare systems, can do it as well on a much greater scale. And again, I emphasize the fact that each individual is different, and risk models are uh, just tools and not the definitive means of providing healthcare. Uh, it still requires speaking to the patient as a provider and with the healthcare team through a shared decision making process uh, through the most informed means possible. And I believe. You know, with uh, having worked with risk indices and risk scores and uh, risk stratification for this uh, these past two years, I think it can be done. And I think, you know, uh, having this uh, sort of change the culture of healthcare delivery and um, providing healthcare in the primary care setting uh, can be of great value in delegating the appropriate high valued and high efficiency care that's necessary on a population level. And with that, uh, I'll turn it to Anis. Hi, sorry, every time I, I click something, <laughs> anything, it goes off, um, the PowerPoint goes off. Um, so when it comes to, to moving towards health equity, um, I, think, I think health equity um, is seen as, a, as an ambiguous topic. Um, and so hopefully this is going to allow for some clarity in that and then kind of in line with what Henry was talking about, you know, give everyone kind of a, a, at least a, an initial starting point as to how to achieve this. Um, so, so health equity in general is, is attaining the highest level of health possible for all people. And it really, it really um, focuses on valuing everyone and, and ongoing social and, and societal efforts to address what are avoidable inequities and inequalities present. So equity needs to be intentionally pursued as a strategy. It's not gonna happen as a byproduct of other uh, development efforts. Um, addressing health inequities then means really addressing differences that aren't, are not just unnecessarily avoidable, uh, but they're just, they're unjust and unfair. And so, you know, here you know, we mentioned a lot about health, health, uh, healthy people 2020. Well, now there's a healthy people 2030, and healthy people 2030, they have a visionary goal of achieving health equity in the upcoming decade, and they have five overarching goals that that really relate towards that achievement, and it, it, it includes uh, attaining healthy, thriving lives and well-being uh, for, for individuals that are free of preventable disease, disability, injury, and uh, premature death, eliminating health disparities, achieving that health equity, and achieving that health literacy to improve overall health and well-being for all, creating social, physical, and economic environments that promote attaining full potential and well-being for, for all, and, um, and also just promoting healthy development, healthy behaviors across all life stages and engaging key leadership, key constituents in the public across multiple sectors to design policies that then improve you know, health and well-being for all. And I think that's where, where we come in in that, in that last piece. Um, and so, you know, understanding what the basic 
uh, differences are are between these definitions is going to be important. And you know, there are important differences between inequality and inequity in health. Um, and so some health inequalities are inevitable uh, because they're attributed to biological difference or free choice. However, health inequities are avoidable. Um, those health inequities are differences in health and well-being that are avoidable, unfair, unjust. They really are affected by social, economic, and environmental conditions. So noticing that while health inequities um, can be uh, really really changed by us and, and the policies that we do, health inequalities may or may not be. Um, and so when we look at health disparities, health disparities are a difference between health status, behavior, um, disability, morbidity, or mortality between social demographic groups. Health care disparities are differences in quality of health care received that are not due to access related factors or clinical needs, preferences, or appropriateness and intervention. And so just keep in mind that, that you know, people are gonna throw out these words and you should know that there are distinct differences in, in all of these. Um, and so a person's overall quality of life and length of life are, you know, is, is determined by a multitude of factors that begin even before a person is born. Now, while we have clinical care that impacts um, preventing, diagnosing, and managing uh, treating diseases, it's only about 20% of a person's overall, overall health that is attributed to or determined by clinical care. Social determinants of health, however, you know, they have a much bigger influence on our health than clinical ones. 60% of a person's health could be driven by like social, behavioral, environmental factors like their education, income, race and ethnicity. And these are conditions that are actually, again, uh, colloquially spoken about as, you know, the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age in. Um, and so, you know, here's just another representation. We call this a social ecological model. Um, the social determinants of health, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> the social determinants of health are shaped by distributions of money, power, and resources at a global, national, and at community levels. And again, like these are mostly responsible for health inequities here. You know, we have social and environmental factors uh, that drive health disparities, including equitable access to education, employment, uh, healthy environments, and healthcare driven by structural systems of oppression, honestly, that include uh, gender discrimination and racism, and then even like uh, unmet social needs um, in general, like uh, these are all formed by what we create as a society. And I think it's important to make the connection then, you know, people who have these unmet social needs, you know, who have health inequities, are actually associated with higher utilization and, and cost to a healthcare system. People who report food insecurity or lack of transportation are more likely to have multiple ED visits um, as compared to, to those who don't and also multiple uh, inpatient stays. And so here's just yet yeah, another way of, of, of categorizing this. Um, and, and I think it's really important to look at the different ways that people can see this. Um, overall, why? Because like no single individual organization or community you know, or sector has sole ownership, accountability, or the capacity to sustain the health and well-being of an entire population. We know this. You know, there, there needs to be um, really just like some kind of synergy between education, housing, healthcare, justice, and other sectors um, to play a role in creating is this um, equitable space for folks and for people to be healthy in order to then reduce these health disparities and advance health equity for all and reach that healthy people 2030 goal, we really need to be able to design um, a system where we can interconnect all these different aspects of public health. Um, you know, what we need to do then is, is look at these efforts and, and try to find a way to change the distribution of power, engage agency to disadvantaged communities, and, and also just empower them to, to then also say, okay, this is what we need, and us to have, to build something that's able to identify and, and meet those needs, hopefully. Uh, sorry, me. one second. And so, you know, in thinking about all of this, um, I'm, I'm hoping everyone's able to keep up with me. <laughs> um, and if not, let me know, please email me. Um, so we have this goal to achieve health equity. And one way to do this is through addressing the social determinants of health, which we all reviewed, you know, but how do you measure this? And so addressing the social determinants of health in clinical care is, is a rapidly evolving field best practices um, and national standards are honestly still in development. 
um, the diversity of early social de determinants of health ecosystems really presents a lot of opportunity and a lot of, um, again, uh, yeah, just a lot of a lot of space where we can have integration of health and social services, but we also have the potential to be to be stymied a little bit by those lack of standards and inconsistent communication. And so what we need to do is we need to increase social cohesion. And, and social co cohesion, um, it could be defined as like a group or a population that works towards the well-being of all of its members. We fight exclusion and marginalization, really promotes a, 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 um, a sense of belonging and trust. And, and, you know, we have to have that in order for us to promote our nation's health. And, 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 and you know, we're, we're looking for, for that ultimately, I think, in this. Um, and so we have to be able to develop strong expectations for then, you know, social determinants of health screening. Because we have to be able to identify all of these determinants of health. In, in, in some way, shape or fashion. And then we have to be able to have the data available to us in a way that we're all able to have a foundation then to, and how to tackle that to create a more equitable space. Now there are, um, there are some um, approaches that have been outlined by, oh, sorry about that, that have been outlined by, by individuals or, or attempted to. You know, this is a list, I apologize again, of, of um, health equity measurements that explore various populations and, and distinct, you know, measurement approaches that they have. And I think I'm here over all the three main ones, ones that's, that's focused on determining existing quality measures. Um, and that's, that's the first box here, you know, and it, here it focuses on measurement identification where, where they're trying to do more of, of a health equity comparison between the same groups and then looking at delivery of healthcare. The second one is engagement of particular kinds of comparisons and it's a measure by measure comparison. Um, and it's between groups of patients um, with greater or lesser social risk burden again. And so, and if we look at the population here, you know, it looks at the social risk and then and it does it in, in, in a in a distinct fashion in that way. And then the last approach kind of looks at a, sim a summary index um, and, and again, all of these, what I'm trying to highlight here is that there are different ways of looking at things um, and health equity in that sense. Um, but these are larger scale measurements and you really miss the granularity in your population by doing this. Notice again, how large these populations are, not necessarily you know, applicable to, to a county um, or to, to, to a certain you know, section of a county. And we have to be able to collect data then that actually focuses in on that. Because if you're, you know, if you're looking at the forest, you, you again might miss the tree. And I think that that's, that's one thing that, that health equity actually uh, makes a transition to. Um, and so this um, uh, Red Healthcare actually you know, had mentioned the set of guidelines for health equity measurements. And so when we think about that, you know, these measures should be based on disparities that are already known and exist for certain populations that address this health disparity and, are, and culturally appropriate care. You know, reflect available evidence in relationship between the social risk factor and health or health care outcome, as we, we defined earlier. And it should be defined to incentivize achievement or improvement for at-risk beneficiaries uh, while including having a valid or appropriate benchmark. And you know, we should then be able to, to, to reference those benchmarks. Um, we should include design that guard against unintended consequences of forcing quality or access or disincentivizing resources for any beneficiary. Um, again, including the at-risk ones that are focused with, the, with this measurement and establish measurability requirements and ensure the ability to re rely, make reliable distinctions between healthcare providers and their performance in the domain of health equity, capture information about all small subgroups when possible while limiting the influence of imprecise uh, estimates for provider performance. And then all of this needs to be summarized in a way that is psychometrically sound and we should really allow for disaggregation of information to permit then easily identifiable um, spaces where we can do quality improvement. And I know that's a lot, um, you know, and, and then I, I kind of went down a rabbit hole looking into, okay, well, does this exist? And, and, and no, it doesn't. Um, but the Loan Institute um, actually tried to create a hospital index. And I think it did, did one rather well that looked at socially responsible hospitals, you know, but then, you know, now we just spoke about what health equity is, you know, and their definition of, 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 not necessarily definition, but what they consider health equity is like, which ones are the are hospitals that are most inclusive in America, invest most in their community and pay their, their hospitals fairly. And so here, you know, their equity measurement is, is somewhat limited compared to what we just saw. 
Um, and so I don't necessarily think that this, um, particularly this, this is a good starting point. However, this doesn't necessarily meet our need. Um, and so how do we, how do we then measure that granularity? Because that's, that's what we're missing here in my mind. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's really first starting with the basics, you know, we want to be able to have a strategy that the, um, or a health, health equity strategy that, that, that has, you know, all of these metrics at least down. You know, I think it first starts with data collection and stratification to identify inequities. And then from there you set your priorities and then it drives improvement activities. You know, so the strategy applies to mul you know, multiple um, numerical performance data and clinical processes. Like and people talk about patient experience and also in public health. And, and we can get dashboards set up and scorecards for different levels at a different healthcare system. Um, at different healthcare systems, and and again, like obtaining that real data, we look at which is which is attributes of race, health, ethni I mean, uh, ethnicity, and language um, that are tied to individual patient records or can be used to stratify um, clinical, patient, and public health measures. SOGI data, sexual orientation, orientation, and and gender identity data is also helpful. And then again, having that social determinants of health screening. Um, this you know for and this goes for any of the data, honestly. Um, when we look at it, we want to make sure it's accurate, it's complete, it's unique, it's timely, and it's consistent throughout all. Um, and, and if we don't have that, then, then it's kind of like we're comparing apples and oranges. Um, and so ideally, again, we want to, we want to collect all of this data in, it, from individuals and, and in that, you know, have it in, in some, some space where we're able to, to go back to it. You know, and then from there also have the determinants of health screening. And so when we have social determinants of health screening tools, like there are multiple tools out there. The National Association of, of Community Health Centers um, have a protocol for responding and assessing uh, patient assets, risks, and experience. They call it the PREPARE tool. It has 15 core questions and 15 um, supplement, I mean, sorry, and five supplemental questions, so a total of 20 questions. Um, and that, can, that, that they've tried to have it uploaded to different EMRs. Um, the American Academy of Family Physicians has their own social determinants of health screening tool. Um, it's part of their Everyone project. And then the CMS has a 10 question tool um, that's health related um, social needs screening. And, and honestly, you know, any of these can be helpful. I think it's, it's determining what would be most helpful for the state or for the region and, and making sure that there's interoperability in all of this. Um, and then, you know, rather than expecting the physicians to add just one more thing to their daily practice, you know, this screening should be um, a team-based effort into the into the practice flow, and it should be inpatient and outpatient. You know, because there's multiple settings where this this tool could be could be Im implemented. And so, again, like um, just to kind of finalize it, um, but I think it would be. And my, my ask, at least, is to kind of create an outpatient hospital level social determinants of health screening with, with collection of real data uh, and one socially cohesive state registry. So then you can, you know, first benchmark your study deliverables and then, uh, you know, provide a current state of what's going on. And then, you know, you can use comparative analytics versus your cohorts to find and then really just identify those actionable opportunities in the state of Vermont, in different pockets of Vermont to then deliver the, the you know, the resources required there. Um, North Carolina is an example of a state that actually has tried to do this. Um, and, in, and in that, you know, they, they may have, uh, I, 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 get, I think um, they, I don't necessarily know if they've achieved it yet, you know, but I think that they're, they're actively working in having, in having something similar in place. So I just wanted to, to use, to use this time to share this with you. And thank you again for allowing me to, to speak. Thanks for being here <laughs> and, and, and doing that. Kevin, you're on mute. Chair Mellon, you're on mute. <laughs> well, that doesn't help, does it? <laughs> The bigger question is, what can we do to keep you here <laughs> and all your fellow classmates? What is the biggest drivers in your decision making when you determine where you want to work? 
Wow. <laughs> what a question. Um, I guess like for me, it's being able to connect with my community and being able to, to assist my community in need. Um, and that's, at least like for me, like my, 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 I think my mission and passion is, is be working in a, in a health equity space. Right. And, and so having, having an infrastructure that can support that is important. And that's, you know, secretly one of my my driver, like if this is in place, this would make it much easier to come back. I think for or the flip side of that is you might be able to be on the ground floor of helping to build that type of system. That's very true. Henry was going to say something. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was just saying, like, yeah, I completely agree with you, Anais. Um, sort of identifying and working with the community uh, that uh, you're going to be working in is uh, a big driver. And, you know, I, I, Maybe this is naive of me <laughs> or uh, whatever, but um, I, I think this is really exciting for primary care. Uh, being uh, going into internal medicine and outpatient medicine uh, as uh, for practice, I, I think this type of um, change in healthcare delivery is what makes primary care exciting. And I think it's the next chapter, sort of looking at um, not just each individual coming through the office as an individual, but going on to sort of a uh, a separate level, a more sort of uh, elevated level and seeing, okay, I have uh, so many patients on my clinic panel um, and, uh, you know, that I'm taking care of uh, in the community. What is sort of a common driver that I can sort of change among hundreds, if not thousands of them with a change in a process or changing a way of um, approaching care in my clinic uh, through sort of data, uh, this data-driven approach. And I think that's really exciting for primary care. We have the technology, we have the methods on, uh, on analyzing it and utilizing that data. We just gotta be really creative and efficient with it uh, to uh, generate this type of change. Um, so that at least for me is you know, exciting and what drives me forward. Well, it's a fascinating presentation. Uh, board members, uh, why don't we go in alphabetical order? Dr. Holmes, Jessica. Sure. Um, well, thank you so much for the presentation and for working with us uh, for the last few months. It's really appreciated. Um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, how do you think training in medical schools has to really change um, to think, you know, just so that our providers and, and nursing schools and other, you know, uh, training areas to better address, you know, uh, social determinants of health and health equities so that providers, when they leave school, are better equipped um, to manage, address, collect data, ask the right questions beyond um, some of these survey tools. But once they have the data at their disposal to be able to better address um, some of those, you know, really valid concerns that you've raised. And I, and I ask that with, you know, having spoken to some providers who feel like I am trained in medicine, I'm not trained in the larger social determinants of health and having to manage, um, you know, navigating that space. So just wondering what you think about uh, training in medical schools, nursing schools, other areas. Do you, do you want me to answer that? Do you want me to answer that, Henry? Uh, we can tag team. Okay. Um, yeah, so so overall, like I think there needs to be an overhaul in in the medical education system, um, and I think it's happening slowly, um, where multiple institutions that are integrating um, health equity um, health equity pr- curriculums. Where, necess- where really what they're doing is they're going through their curriculum and adding in that lens, that perspective, and and really you know seeing okay what is what is the the root cause of all of these things. Um, and I, I know that's happening from a medical school standpoint. I'm not sure if it's happening from a nursing school standpoint. Um, and, and in that as well, different medical schools should be providing what's available to the community. You know, how, what are community, what, what does the community have? You know, what resources are available and what can you provide to the patient that's in front of you? You know, and, and, and I feel like it's, it's a medical school's responsibility to a degree to have that, that list, quote unquote, or whatever be it, you know, that resource available because they're in the community. They're the ones that are there constantly versus like medical students go in and out. Um, 
So I would think that that to me, that that is like a, a staple of what should be provided. And I think with regards to uh, the general overhaul, um, that's certainly, you know, very large 30,000 foot view perspective. And that, that takes time, that takes years uh, to, to change. Um, I, I think what uh, I, I'm just drawing from, you know, my own training, I, I'm from a school uh, in, in uh, the greater New York City area. And so each individual medical school has their own approach to um, uh, socioeconomic inequalities, healthcare inequalities as well. And uh, I think the curriculum ought to be adjusted to what is um, uh, local to the school, but taught in a way that, uh, you know, in a framework so that that framework can be applied wherever that uh, individual medical student goes. Um, and finding out uh, that framework is difficult. Um, and I, I think the next step would be to actually um, perhaps, you know, I'm speaking about associations, but Association of American Medical Colleges, uh, AAMC, they're uh, taking the next few steps to, to um, sort of uh, figure that out and to have uh, recommendations uh, um, uh, created for medical schools in the United States and Canada uh, to, uh, to try and, you know, brainstorm on how can we approach this sort of education in a framework uh, perspective, but have that framework be applicable and experiential for the student itself. And obviously, I, I can only speak to uh, medical school training. Thank you. Back to you, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Next, we'll move to board member Lund. Robin. Thank you. Um, I found both of parts of the presentation very interesting. So thank you so much for your work and for sharing your work with us today. Um, I'm, I, I'm really intrigued by the health equity lens and thinking about how we can start to incorporate that in, uh, you know, from our perspective as regulators, we you know, have certain regulatory tasks that we perform uh, on behalf of the state. And and uh, this isn't really a question, it's just more kind of me thinking out loud from a lot of what you presented and um, and, and the thoughts. So I, I need more time to digest, but um, I, I think it's really intriguing to think about how do we start to build that framework in a way that's, um, thoughtful. Um, and also one thing we, we hear a lot from providers is, oh my God, you know, we have enough measurement, don't measure us more, but how do we like balance all the interests and make sure we're measuring the right thing in the right way without adding administrative burden and that kind of thing. So just a comment, but I really appreciate um, the discussion. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll turn to board member Pelham, Tom. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for this presentation. It's uh, uh, one of these presentations that can overwhelm you as you're trying to uh, integrate all the moving parts. And so I'm try with trying to think about a way to simplify some of it. And you know, one of the things that um, you know I notice is that you know that in Vermont healthcare is 20% of the economy. I mean, it's a big deal. And uh, there's a lot of resource out there. And But I don't think in the public debate, um, and this is an election year, in the public debate, health care is one of the issues um, that is front and center, you know, at the granular level. If you're, if you're talking at the local level, you know, the former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, uh, would say that all politics is local. And so I'm thinking, how might a this process get its arms around having um, some influence in the political process. And I would think that, hey, there's only 30 senator seats uh, in the state of Vermont. You know, may maybe uh, folks who are, are of your orientation um, can bring focus to some of the issues that you're concerned about by just fo focusing on 30 elections, uh, maybe holding a candidate's night or maybe holding a, uh, a forum um, on on uh, internet or maybe getting Vermont Digger to sponsor some forum so that these issues can be raised uh, front and center. It's, uh, 
Um, so if unless I'll give you a hypothetical, say some rich person were to come along and say, you know, here's twenty thousand dollars. You got an election year coming up. You know, what would you do? How would you invest that twenty thousand dollars in 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 the promotion of of your interests in um, kind of data driven social determinants of health, uh, preventive health, health care? What would you do with it? Besides pay off your student loans. I'm, assu I'm, I'm assuming that's off, off the table. That's an interesting question. So what would I do with $20,000 that would be helpful in the space of, of health equity or social determinants of health? And this is, this is, I'm going to, this is just because it's my part of the presentation. I know Henry talks about risk calculators, so he probably inv invested in data infrastructure. <laughs> um, well, well, I think like, you know, I'd probably put it, give it to the, the community health workers um, and, and have a community health workers kind of have various health fairs. And then from that, um, have screening questionnaires available to those individuals who participate in it and, in, and, and collect the data from the health fairs to kind of have a, at least a screen, a, a, a snapshot as to what's going on in the community with, with regards to determinants of health um, and where then my next bolus of money would be put to. Um, so that's that's just like a good one idea, but yeah, I mean, my 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 part of my background in in the earlier years was uh, don't agonize, organize, um, and uh, you know I was involved in a group of people who um, stopped highway construction through low income neighborhoods in Somerville and Cambridge and the the Boston area, um, and literally stopped them. They were on the drawing boards, bids were out, and. Uh, and changed public policy in Boston to um, one of pro-transit, extend the transit system out to Alewife, um, out to Oak Grove and, and Melrose, south to Braintree. Um, and it was, you know, a four or five year effort and uh, it was a hammer and tong. And so the media was important, you know, getting some of the media folks to understand it. Um, and I'm kind of looking at that experience, which was Helter Skelter, and looking at where we are here on healthcare in Vermont. And it doesn't seem to have reached a critical mass of awareness out there. It's still a kind of a, um, you know, a, a, a side issue um, relative to some of the other issues that are front and center in Vermont. And so I, I, I you know, that's kind of what, where my mind went as you're presenting, where would I go to, to bring this issue that, consumes 20% of the Vermont economy. Um, that is, you know, it's not front and center in the legislature this year. I mean, healthcare is, it's important, and it's a big issue, but it's, it's not, it's not a, a drive, an issue that is driving elections. And my guess is you're not gonna hear a lot about it on the campaign trail. But it's just, just something to think about that that data can be used in a political context to affect how people vote. And I'll just add, you know, I completely agree with Anis going down to the community level. And I think one of my uh, emphases is um, to speak with the citizen, to speak with, you know, the patient, uh, your constituents. Um, and I think putting that money um, into the local health fair drives and raising that awareness um, is probably the most efficient uh, way to go about it. Um, and I think Anis and I are on the same page of, on, on, on that uh, topic. Uh, I'm not a politician, <laughs> nor do I think I um, will ever will be. Uh, it's, it's not my realm of expertise. Um, and certainly, you know, um, there, I would just caution on sort of uh, the phrase using data uh, in a political manner, mainly because, you know, from our perspective, we are scientists. We like to uh, use data objectively and, and uh, for a good scientific purpose and the benefit of um, everyone. And so um, putting uh, that into sort of a political purpose uh, doesn't really sit right with me. Um, I, I like things to be peer reviewed, open to the public. And uh, if you have criticisms, great, uh, let's discuss them. Um, but, um, you know, sort of that uh, uh, perspective on creating it uh, towards a political lens, uh, through a political lens, is, um, it doesn't sit well. Well, that's just kind of the authenticity, I think, that attracts people, though. I mean, if 
I mean, if you're going to use data and use it in a public, even political setting, you know, you can have people that present it that aren't very authentic and authentic, authentic, and people can see that. Um, whereas others, like how you're coming across now, speaking truth to power, just saying this is the data, and we want to solve these problems, and we want the political system to be addressing them. Just offhand conversation, but I, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you politicize your data, but that you use good good, solidly well-crafted data to tell a story that people can rip, you know, wrap their arms around. I think, I think actually that's a good suggestion. You know, it, it, like it, to tell the story the way the story is, you know, and then in doing that, that's how, that's how you're able to, to get support for, you know, your next notion or your next movement towards, towards, whatever it may be, but you know, I don't necessarily think it needs to be aligned to any kind of political party or anything like that, but it could be told by, by other folks who are at reach with the people in a political sense. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Tom. Very authentic question. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we'll turn to board member Walsh, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thanks for being with us, Henry and Anais. Um, I enjoyed your presentation a lot. It was informative and inspiring. You know, I got my start a long time ago now as a clinician. I got interested in outcome research and really trying to do what I could to understand everything that I was reading, the data that I was reading and the evidence. Um, and I learned that being evidence-based um, is difficult because it can change. And that requires you as the clinician to be able to adapt and change, right? And that's hard when if there's something that you've been doing and there's you find out that the evidence isn't there for it to then go learn to do something different is really hard. And that evidence-based approach and creating a learning system um, and agility and apt adaptability in a system. You, know, you guys are in a leadership program. You're going to be in roles where you're trying to build systems like that. And you'll be maybe taking roles in your community where maybe there will be some political aspect or some regulatory aspect. And, and it, you've just reminded me and inspired me to, even in my new regulatory role, to think about what is the evidence for the decisions that we're making? And am I, can I help create a learning system and create agility and adaptability in that system so that we're using evidence to drive the decisions that we're facing? And we can be transparent in that, right? And I can, I can see why the two of you are, are here. You know, Henry, your, your desire to, to understand risk stratification and the benefits of, of that, the insights that it comes. Well, addressing inequities means that we identify the risks, the population, the parts of the population that are the most at risk, and then making sure that they're receiving the resources they need to achieve equal outcomes, which is Anais's part, right? And so it's really, can, can we as regulators help bring about changes where there are healthcare systems, have the data, to stratify the way that Henry can, to find out what the needs of the population and the individuals are. And then can we design a learning system that can adapt once we know where the subpopulation is, the hot spot, or the patients with rising risk, that we can move resources to address those things, right? And you're learning how to do that as clinicians, um, it's exciting. It, it's great. It's what woke me up in the morning. And, and to think of how do we build, um, how do we bring that type of thinking into our policy making and our regulatory work? So, so you've inspired me. And I, I hope that as you keep going, as you get into your different <clears throat> roles, you reflect and, and think, you know, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be teaching others how to do these things, or advocating for them. Also, remember to look internally with, within yourself. Can people see the principles and practices 
it, can they see what you care about in the principles and practices of the organizations you're in, the culture that you help create, and the budgets, right? When we when we look at, we want to say in, inequity is important. We should be able to see evidence of changes in inequities through the principles and practices of our organizations, the culture of those organizations, and the budgets. So I, I just hope you keep those things in mind as you go forward. And uh, once again, thanks for being here. Um, it was you know, informative, inspiring, and um, the example of Fred was illustrative. So um, thanks. So as a final question from the board before we open it up for public comment, I just want to uh, ask you if you could share how you came to your decision. You're both uh, uh, specializing in internal medicine, um, which some people would say is a specialty. Others would argue it's primary care. Others would argue it's both. But was there some point in your educational or personal career that um, helped you focus and decide that internal medicine was the, the medicine that you wanted to pursue? I could go first this time. Um, that's a great question. I am uh, the first person in my family to ever become a physician. And so in my mind, I guess you can say that the image of a physician was a medicine physician. Uh, in my mind, right? It was medicine or surgeon. Um, and for me, uh, medicine dealt with a lot more thinking. Um, and certain, certainly, you know, there, there's acuity and procedures involved. But for medicine, it was a lot of um, uh, very scientifically heavy. It was more stimulating um, cerebrally. Uh, and uh, for uh, the training aspect, I, I think um, thinking about the physiology and thinking about pathophysiology, the correct medication and therapies was more of a uh, mental stimulant than um, anything else. Um, being, you know, I had thoughts of becoming a pediatrician, but I found out that uh, it was too touching. I mean, my emotions, I couldn't handle seeing a, a sick child. So that, that, was, that diverted me away from it. And uh, I definitely at times thought about um, uh, general surgery. Um, but uh, I found, you know, it was great. I worked with my hands uh, in, in the OR, uh, managed patients on the floors as a medical student uh, during my clerkships. But uh, ultimately, uh, I found myself being drawn more towards the uh, floor patient management uh, of patients medically than I was um, sort of uh, uh, more interested in the procedural aspect. So that's what drove me to deciding on uh, going into medicine, internal medicine. That was, that was, that was really nice, Henry. <laughs> um, so so I'm, I'm an infectious disease. So, um, so I'll, I'll kind of focus more on, on why I went into infectious disease. Um, and so medicine drew me more for the cerebral aspect. And I, I found myself asking a lot of why, <laughs> how did this happen? Why? And then um, my family is from the Dominican Republic and I actually spent my formative years in the Dominican Republic. Um, and so for me, global health is really important um, and seeing the interconnectivity of just even antimicrobial resistance, um, you know, that to me, like in the Dominican Republic during my training, I, I saw a wide array of different bacterial resistances. I saw tropical neglected diseases and I saw a lack of infrastructure um, to support, you know, treatment of, of such conditions. And, and with that, you know, I have I, I've just had multiple encounters and I've, and I've met with enough people that I was like, OK, you know, infectious disease interests me. And then um from an advocacy standpoint, most of the infectious disease dogs that I encountered during my training were the, the biggest health advocates that I that I knew, and so with that, you know, I, I, it kind of felt like I just naturally slipped into to, to wanting to do infectious disease, and and um, and it and it actually like I, I I've never felt more fulfilled <laughs> in a in a specialty because infectious disease like again it is a lot of intersections. We have a pandemic now, which I did not sign up for, but it's here. Um, but the intersection of, of public health in that 
you know, really, it really just strikes home. So, so that's kind of what drove me into where I'm at. Great. It's, you know, too often we hear uh, the stories that uh, um, your peers cho choose their professions because of the uh, dollar aspects. And clearly we're not hearing that today. And uh, it, neither one of you even mentioned that, which was great in my book. So with that, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment? Yeah, I'm going to start with Dale Hackett. Dale? Hi, just two quick questions. Um, one, I think, has already been visited, but I just wanted to revisit it again. Um, but for example, I was in Maine, and I was as rural as you could get out there versus what rural is here. Um, and yet the people are, I was with, I mean, one of them's a OR nurse and she's totally happy living that role and working at the hospital. Um, you know, they're, they're five miles from the nearest store and yet the hospital that she works at is closer than UVM Medical Center. It, it was intriguing. And the other person, you know, has to travel an hour and 45 minutes just to get to where they work. And again, they're happy, but they're, you know, the, you just walk up the street and you can see Mount Washington. They're in a beautiful area. So the question would simply be Vermont's rural too, yet we don't seem to have that same effect on people in terms of them wanting to come to. Vermont. So I'm sort of re-asking the question about what's the one thing that you would really need to see to be in Vermont um, versus other New England states. The other question is, I'm very curious in terms of the training you've received in your medical school, how do you see that being applied if you were to go to any state in the country, do you feel prepared or do you feel prepared for some states, but not for others? Um, I'm, I'm asking a really macro question there, but those are my questions. Denise Henry, either one of you want to uh, tackle those uh, questions? Thank you, Mr. Hackett, for, for the questions. Um, with regards to uh, the first question, which is uh, what aspect of Vermont, uh, if I may rephrase the question, what aspect of Vermont will um, be enticing for healthcare providers to come to Vermont and practice here? Is that is that a, a, a fair rewording? Yes, it is. Okay, Thank great. You. Um, well, Vermont is great, uh, and, uh, you know, um, being in the Upper Valley area. Um, it's uh, certainly a rewarding place, uh, beautiful, all four seasons. Um, and uh, I'll just say personally for myself, I'm not speaking for others, um, Vermont offers a great rural uh, lifestyle, but it's not something that I personally was, uh, would consider be fitting for me. Uh, and certainly that's not true uh, for everyone else. You know, that's just a, a personal um, uh, preference and family preference. Um, and the second one, and I'll just lay it out here, uh, mainly because Susan and uh, we have all discussed it, um, the amount of paperwork and the steps on actually acquiring a Vermont medical license is quite significant. And uh, I have to say, I personally gave up after three to four months of trying. And you guys still have my check. Uh, I haven't asked for it back because I haven't found the time. Um, so uh, that's, that's another. And I, I think that's a little more concrete and um, uh, actionable. Um, you know, I, I've worked with the state of New Hampshire and it took, I, I think, six to eight weeks. Um, and they were very communicative. 
and uh, it was straightforward. I got a lot of help, um, and I didn't necessarily have to pay anyone to complete it for me. Uh, whereas for Vermont, it was, um, you know, it was a little rougher. Uh, and, and, you know, at, at this moment, I don't um, have a need to uh, seek it and uh, see it through. Um, but uh, that, that could be something to consider moving forward. Thank you. Okay, next, we'll turn to Walter Carpenter. Walter. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Dale got my first question, so I won't repeat it. But the second question concerns health equity. I've always been curious about this phrase um, because it doesn't say anything to me. And I say this as a patient who's been that Fred that Henry talked about. Uh, you know, I've been there. Um, can't afford health care, can't do this. Um, losing insurance in the middle of treatments and stuff like that, because our healthcare system is actually built on inequity. If you say that equity means equality, um, <clears throat> its whole purpose is inequality, you know, buy low, sell high. So I think I was more curious on how you wanted to address that. I mean, as, as, new doctors coming into a system like this and <clears throat> how, you know, it's health inequity by cost is what it is, you know, deliberately. Um, how would a new student or a new person coming into the medical field want to address that if possible? So um, I, I think you bring up a good point in the sense that, you know, health healthcare delivery delivery in general, like in the healthcare industry is, is definitely like very cost, very money driven, you know, and that's and that's separate from health equity, because in, in my mind, like health equity, I think, as we mentioned before, is that notion of, of people attaining their highest level of possible health that they are able to do, you know, and there's you know, and, and attaining that healthy life that's free of preventable illness, disability, inner injury, premature death. That to me is what health equity is. And, and, and so social economic drivers can lead to either, you know, more a more equitable space or inequitable space, right? And so not having the means to, to, go, to, your, to go to your visits, you know, not having the means to, to get treatments, like that, that is, is, is an equity, um, as you mentioned. And so, you know, as a provider, what I would do in the clinic is I would actually talk to a social worker and see if the social worker ha knows of any programs that's available from, uh, from at least the state first um, to see if it can help overcome the barrier that you have to achieve your health equity. If not, then I would actually go to the particular insurance company or the the um, the, the the medication um, company or wh whoever to ask them directly. Hey, this is what's going on with my individual patient. How can we work this out so they can get the care that they need? You know, and, and that going to that level. You know, I, ideally we won't have to do that if we set up a system that allows for people to actually have the care that they need when they need it. And to add on, to add on to Anais's point, everything that uh, she had mentioned is pretty much what I deal with every day uh, as well in the in a primary care setting. Uh, and thankfully, I have um, you know secretaries, nurses, and um, uh, pharmacists to help me with that. But that is a key factor in burnout. Okay, uh, sort of healthcare provider burnout. It's uh, sort of ten percent face to face direct patient care and speaking with our patients, and ninety percent. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, yeah. but 90% administrative, um, you know, all of the other things that are involved. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I, I think, uh, Walter, thanks for your question. The um, uh, how, how do we actually uh, address it in incoming uh, uh, individuals new to sort of the healthcare sphere uh, from students and, and trainees? Um, we, I, I feel like the problem is we revolve too much around the, the dollar sign. Uh, I, I think 
you know, uh, using some sort of currency uh, is a great way to communicate uh, equity or in inequality um, in, in sort of, uh, uh, so everyone is on the same page, right? It's a currency. But unfortunately, that becomes so ingrained that, um, you know, you made the analogy of, uh, was it buy low, sell high, right? Unfortunately, that, that analogy uh, comes from sort of sticking around uh, some form of currency. And that's where, you know, I, myself, and I, in, you know, in, in the presentation, I emphasize the fact that we have to sort of shift away from this culture of trying to build uh, the maximal amount of, um, uh, for billing that patient encounters possible, figuring out the correct uh, billing code. We have to you know, divert ourselves away from that and actually look at it from a value-based perspective, which is what are some of the key aspects, the low-hanging fruit in an uh, individual's social risk, healthcare risk, um, that we can approach and tackle and uh, have not only healthcare savings um, moving forward, but also uh, perhaps figure out something and uh, uh, prevent a budget catastrophe down the road as well. And I, I think that that's um, uh, that definitely will take time to, to shift that in culture. I agree about the culture. I agree pretty much what you said. I'm not a big fan of value based because I still don't understand it yet. Um, even though I've been dealing with it for five, six, seven years, and I've been, I've studied healthcare systems all around the world and stuff. One of the problems we have is access. Um, this is the one issue we haven't been able to solve. We don't have the polit we could solve it. We don't have the political will to do it. Um, <clears throat> Access, we have enough data where I think if you laid the data out to the moon, I could walk up to the moon and back on all the data we've taken about the healthcare system. And I sit, I've sat in probably in hundreds of committee meetings where all I've listened to is data. We seem to want more. So that's not, that's not the issue. It's the, I agree with you, it's the whole culture. That I agree. It's based around the dollar sign. That's the unequal access. I don't see value-based as doing that because value-based, you're still insurance, you're still deductibles, you're still co-pays. The whole thing is designed to prevent you from getting health care so that you don't cut in the bottom line. And when you're a patient, you're especially one with an illness that's longer than a, a little while, you're a medical loss. And the question, again, I was just trying to address how would a medical student coming into the field who wants to go into primary care, and I've worked with many as a student in my various primary care visits, how would you go about addressing that or trying to change that and make it into a different culture? But that's just the. <clears throat> I, I think, um, Walter, you uh, hit the nail on the head. It, it takes a lot of thought and consideration, um, and certainly uh, um, beyond our discussion today. Uh, so <laughs> I thank you for that question. And uh, certainly, we all will have a lot to, to reflect on and think about. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Is there other something problem? on the head? <laughs> Thanks, Walter. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I want to thank you both. Um, a great conversation, and uh, you're a positive image for the hope for the future. So thank you. With that, Thanks I'm going to. Too. You're welcome. With that, I'm going to go to uh, old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. 
Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.